The legend of the outlaw hero Robin Hood is perhaps the most famous example of English folklore. It stands alongside the King Arthur legends as a story that has survived in popularity right up until the modern era. For historians it provides a significant trove of information about Middle Age English culture. In some ways superior to the King Arthur legends because it allows a cultural analysis of what was popular culture among the lower orders of society. In this video I'm going to explore the origins of that story, specifically whether there was a historical Robin Hood and the difficulties of that investigation, and additionally the insights we gain from the earliest tales about the cultural and social issues that were prevalent in the Middle Age English society. I do also have some personal interest in these legends. So my family on my dad's side come from the Midlands, not far from Nottingham, and my grandparents on my mother's side lived in Yorkshire throughout my childhood. Much of my love of history comes from childhood trips to historic sites in these areas, specifically in Yorkshire. I studied history at Nottingham University as well, and the local interest in the Robin Hood tales meant that I did naturally end up studying this during my bachelor's degree. Alongside other surviving cultural sources, such as the Luttrell Psalter, we look to the jest of Robin Hood. So many of the angles I am coming from in this video were influenced by that course, and how we were taught to approach English Middle Age culture. I hope you all find this interesting. So there are two candidates for a historical Robin Hood that I wish to look at in order to give an understanding of where historians have gone looking for a potential individual starting point for this folk hero. The first takes us to Wakefield. Now it is typically agreed that Yorkshire and not Nottinghamshire is the more likely setting for the original stories, and therefore perhaps the man as well. Barnsdale Forest is mentioned several times in the earlier ballads, and although the major enemy of Robin Hood in these original stories remains the Sheriff of Nottingham, the prevalence of the Barnsdale locality cannot be ignored. I concede it is a curiosity, obviously, as to why the Sheriff would involve himself with an outlaw that is based a good 50 kilometres away from the base of his operations. Joseph Hunter, and then later the esteemed medieval historian James C. Holt, put forward a man called Robert Hood, also known as Robertus Hood in the records. He is present in the Wakefield court rolls around 1316. At this time, the English king was Edward II. This Robert was the son of a forester who worked for the Earl de Warren. In 1316, he ignored summons to join Edward II's forces, and it is speculated that he was outlawed in 1322 for being part of a rebellion led by the Earl Thomas of Lancaster. Lancaster was a baron who led the political opposition to Edward II, following disaster at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, or I guess a triumph if you're listening in Scotland, Lancaster essentially ruled England in the disgraced Edward's stead. However, his rule was no more popular with the barons than Edward's was, and in 1318 he accepted diminished power, and then by 1322 he was leading a rebellion. He was defeated at the Battle of Boroughbridge, and in the aftermath of this, he was executed by beheading, the usual sentence of hanging, drawing, and quartering commuted in light of his royal lineage. It is recorded in 1322 that the man named Robert Hood had his property confiscated, and such punishment suggests an act against the crown. It has been theorised, due to the story in the jest of Robin Hood, that this Robert Hood may have also been the same man who entered the service of Edward II, and was pardoned shortly after he was made an outlaw. Although interesting to note that if this pardon happened after 1327, then the king in question could have been Edward III, who seized power in 1330, but he'd also been kinged in de jura since 1327. The Wakefield court rolls list a Robert Hood several times up until 1333. The historian's case for this individual largely mirrors the story in the jest, where Robin is taken into the service of the king, despite being an outlaw, and then he leaves the service of this king after a year. It was believed the individual joined the king's service when he made the trip to Nottingham. However, it has been proven that he had joined the king earlier than this, again throwing doubt on Nottingham as the true location for the events of the stories. The first record of this Robin Hood was located when the king would have been closer to Barnsdale. One of the key strengths for this exact case is that the 14th century is a viable time frame for a historical Robin. For instance, the historians point to the importance of the longbow in the myths, which is a particular indicator that points to this century. The longbow status in English culture reached its peak during the Hundred Years' War with France, a series of conflicts that began in 1337. 
During the reign of Edward III, the practice of archery was greatly encouraged, and he even passed laws to impress, which is conscription by force, Fletchers and Bowyers, which are bowmakers, into the English army. Now what are the main issues with this case in particular? So this Robert Hood was noted to have been granted yeoman status later in life for services to his country, and his earlier status was noted as the son of a forester. This path to noble status does not necessarily fit with the earlier legends, which claim otherwise, describing Robin as being a yeoman throughout his life, and his companions were mostly yeomen as well. To clarify what a yeoman was, this was essentially a noble rank, but it was below that of a knight. This places him above the common folk, but not too high into the English social classes. The other issue with trying to identify the historical Robin by focusing on a name is that especially by the late 14th century, the name had become incredibly common. Graham Seal finds in his work that 12 different men named Robin Hood had been tried as bandits from the late 14th century up until the 16th century. It had become a name that was adopted by outlaws looking to raise their own infamy. The commonality of the name, the inconsistency of the spellings, and the attribution of the last name Hood to many outlaws has made the potential pool of historical inspirations vast, to put it mildly. There is one more attempt to place Robin in history that deserves a mention. This relates to placing him as the Earl of Huntingdon. The issue with this historic placement is that it puts the outlaw hero in the time of Richard the Lionheart and John I, in the 12th century. The individual in question was a subject of a fictitious history of Robin Hood, which names him as Robert Fitzsooth, Earl of Huntingdon, born in the reign of Henry II in about 1160. This history was reinforced by the plays of Anthony Mundy, around the time of the 16th century. It may well have been a literary concoction of Mundy himself to play Tom Robin Hood in this time period, and some historians credit Mundy as such. While there appears to be no documentation at all to back this history up, the reign of Richard I has endured in culture as a typical setting for retelling the Robin Hood legends. In fact, many of the more well-known Robin Hood tropes to modern audiences appeared in the Tudor era and were not present in the earlier ballads at all. One final point of investigation into the historical Robin has centred around the potential location of his grave. The ballads largely agree on his death and the grave is mentioned in many of the earlier sources. John Leyland, who was a giant figure among Tudor-era historians, he was to some extent the personal historian of Henry VIII, and he wrote that the grave was most likely to be found between Wakefield-upon-Calder and Halifax. As is recorded in the surviving ballads, his grave should be found adjacent or near to the Kirklees nunnery, where he was supposed to have met his end. The Kirklees Hall estate is in Calderdale, West Yorkshire, and there is a grave bearing a plaque noting it to be the grave of Robin Hood. However, the plaque lists him as the Earl of Huntingdon, and it is not written in recognised form of Middle English. Also, the grave was noted to have been restored in 1850, which is probably around the date the plaque was put in place. The remains of the nunnery are a scheduled monument, and you can find this info on the Historic England website. Although the estate is privately owned, and they, they only allow visitors once a year to come and have a look at the Robin Hood Grave Monument and the buried remains of the Kirklees Priory, along with other parts of the estate which are also listed buildings. The estate owners themselves admit the Robin Hood connection is almost entirely fantasy, however they note that no other location has been linked, as Kirklees has, to the outlaw's death and burial. In general, the main issue we have with trying to find the historical Robin Hood is just a lack of sources. J.C. Holt, who made the valiant attempt to flesh out the case for Robert of Wakefield, summed it up best when he claimed that we are unfortunately one or two surviving ballads short of having the required information to find him if he did exist. And then there are the historians who propose the argument that no actual person fits the outlaw legends we have. A bunch of spoil sports, really. While the search for historical Robin is interesting, at least to see how the historians go about tracking down potential candidates, it is not what I consider to be the true value of the surviving sources. Instead, they are significantly more useful in granting insight into the culture of the 14th and 15th centuries, in an area that is sometimes hard to study beneath the political movements of the highest classes, 
we have these ballads to look to as an example of popular culture of the time. So we're going to look at the earliest ballads and see which social issues arise and what can be gleaned from the tales. The major early ballads are The Jest of Robin Hood, Robin and the Monk, and Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne. And there are some others worth mentioning as well about different characters that either bear similarity to the Hood legends or may have had some crossover. The Hood figure in the ballads is widely viewed as a figure in opposition to the corruption of the era. Corruption found in both the secular and religious authorities. Primarily this is found in the character's interactions with different levels of English society. The common folk, the religious men, his fellow nobles, the secular authorities, and also the crown. The figure is for the most part shown as the virtuous outlaw. And the antagonists are primarily the authorities that look to catch and punish him, despite his obvious virtues. His relationship with the crown is probably the most intriguing part of this. Despite the king being the peak of both secular and religious authority, at this time, Robin Hood is always shown to be a loyal subject of the king. It supports the overriding theory that Hood is not an anti-feudal character. The issue is not with the system, but with the actors who are subverting the system for their own nefarious ambitions. To start with the interplay between Hood and the secular or common law authorities, we can look to the jest of Robin Hood. In this ballad, which is actually considered to be an amalgamation of different stories, Hood is contending with his most famous enemy, the Sheriff of Nottingham. Despite his consistent portrayal in the jest as a man of godly practices, particularly in his devotion to the Virgin Mary and also his battle against corruption, the Sheriff still hunts him as a common outlaw. Robin shows himself to be a man of value to society as well by winning an archery contest that the Sheriff held whilst in disguise. Competitions such as these, specifically the May Day Games, grew in popularity in the 14th and 15th centuries, and it is believed this occurred in conjunction with the popularity of the Robin Hood legends. After the archery contest, the sheriff captures a secondary protagonist in the jest, a knight that Robin had lent money to, called Sir Richard of Lee. Upon rescuing his knightly companion, Robin brutally murders the sheriff. Now Robin's brutality is quite startling in this ballad, and it perhaps speaks to the audience's presumed opinion of the sheriff, that despite his authority, this murder is to be viewed as just within the context. And this is not a standalone occasion, by the way, of Robin enacting brutal retribution on the authorities. In the ballad Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne, he faces off in a duel against another authority figure sent to bring him to justice. I rate this personally as the best of the early ballads, but while entertaining, it doesn't have as much to show historians about middle-aged society. But amidst the drama, we could view Guy of Gisborne as an avatar of secular justice that hunts Robin for his crimes. The two contest their skill in archery, obviously, before fighting to the death. In victory, Robin cuts off Guy's head and mounts it on his bow. Honestly, if you're going to read a ballad, I do recommend this one. It is the most dramatic, and despite being written in late Middle English, I didn't struggle with it as much as the others. Potentially more important than Robin's fights with the secular authorities are his interactions and confrontations with religious figures. Treacherous and corrupt holy men are the most obvious recurrence in all of the tales. Even the eventual supposed killer of the outlaw hero was reported to be a prioress. So we can start with the jest again, the first part of the tale involves a knight called Sir Richard of Lee. In the story, the knight owes money to an abbot as he has had to take out loans to protect his son from the law. Robin lends the knight money, claiming that the Virgin Mary will guarantee the loan. The knight returns to the abbot, but pretends he does not have the money, just to check if the abbot is capable of forgiving the debt. And when the abbot fails this test, the knight reveals he actually has the money, but does not pay. The portrayal of Robin in the night, in contrast with these religious authorities, divulges certain attitudes towards the clergy. True virtuous men remove themselves from society in the tales, or are downtrodden within it, while the unscrupulous claim the positions of moral authority. There's also another story where Robin and his men rob a monk, who then in the process lies to them about his wealth. And Robin sees the bounty they collect from this clergyman to be the Virgin Mary repaying his loan. Robin's death in the jest is probably the most egregious act by a religious figure in any of the ballads. The prioress who is accused of excessively bleeding Robin to death is not just a religious woman, she is also described as being the cousin of the outlaw. 
In terms of crimes, she is accused of killing her own family, killing a patient she was treating at the time, and doing so on the instigation of her lover, one Roger the Red. No doubt at the time it would be a scandalous situation for a prioress to have a known lover. All this feeding into the theme of the ballad is that these figures of supposed virtue were in fact the opposite, and their existence in their societal roles hurt society in general, in this instance causing the death of a virtuous hero. Beyond the jest, we also have the ballad Robin Hood and the Monk, which as you can tell by the name is relevant to the church. The Monk character is the main antagonist in this ballad. He was previously a victim of Robin Hood's robberies, and he also has Robin arrested later on. He is later killed by Little John, and John would then use the monk's reputation and also the secular authorities' willingness to trust the clergy in order to trick those authorities into releasing Robin back to them. One of the authorities Little John tricks by impersonating the monk in that tale is the king himself. And this segues us nicely into discussing Robin's relationship with the king in these tales. In the monk ballad, the king sees the good in Robin and his men, and despite being fooled, allows them to remain at large. He admires Little John's loyalty to his outlaw captain. As is often the case in the stories, it shows that his band of outlaws would be approved by England's highest authority, despite being enemies of the authorities in the space between the king and the common folk. Their struggle against corruption is not only seen as just by the masses, but also to their sovereign. And Robin shows himself subservient in the ballads to both his god and his king. In the jest, the relationship with the king is much more fleshed out and direct. In that story, the king, named as Edward, meets Robin in disguise and mingles with the outlaws. Upon Edward revealing himself, Robin declares he is ever the king's faithful servant. The king, in turn, invites Robin to join his court. Robin would eventually leave and return to the Greenwood, the court reportedly too inactive a place for him and its participants revelling in far too much wealth. The king in question may be Edward IV, or by some historians Edward I, as he is referred to as Edward our comely king, denoting him as handsome, so we have to go through the records and figure out which kings were considered handsome. As I touched upon earlier, Robin Hood's relationship and deference to the king does dampen any suggestion that the character is a cultural call to revolution, or an avatar of peasant rebellion, or really representing opposition to the feudal system in any way. The king repeatedly sees the good in Robin's actions despite his outlaw status. It lands the ballads in the character as coming from a more reformist angle. The corruption must be fought and weeded out, but the system overall did not require rebuilding. Even though the character was not a call to revolution among the lower orders, he was presented as a figure that interacted with all levels of society and showed in certain actions that he was a hero to the common English people. His home in the Greenwood has been theorised by commentators to have been a fantasy haven for disenchanted yeomen and commoners. Robin is also depicted to have commanded tremendous loyalty from his men, who may well have been of mixed stations before they were made outlaws. In the tale with the monk, most of the story is the men going to great lengths to rescue him, and much of the king's admiration comes from seeing this loyalty in action. In the Guy of Gisborne tale as well, Robin is horrified by Little John's suggestion that he should stay back while his men put themselves in danger for his sake. There are a couple more social issues that pop up in the texts. A general theme of new urban centres clashing with rural lifestyles is one. Robin and his men being symbolic of a romantic yearning for traditional rural living, while his enemies and hardships come from the drama and corruption made in English towns. Again, the Greenwood plays its part as an idyllic imagining of English countryside. A final point to touch on with the ballads is that there are a couple of texts not centred on a character called Robin Hood, but have earned a mention by historians for their similarity, or potentially they feature the character as a secondary protagonist. The first is A Tale of Gamelin, a 14th century romance, but it has also been suggested that this may be from the 13th century. According to historian Maurice Keane, this is the oldest surviving outlaw text in English folklore, and was included in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales although it was not considered to have been written by Chaucer himself. The reason this is relevant is that, despite Gamelin clearly being a different character, the ballad bears some significant resemblances to the Robin Hood myths. The antipathy towards the clergy is a big one, for instance. There has been some suggestion this story was formed during a transition point before the ballads of Robin Hood became widespread in the 15th century. Finally, we have Robin and Gandolin surviving from the 15th century. 
There is a character called Robin in this ballad who dies at the beginning of the story. It's uncertain whether this is actually Robin Hood who is killed, but the story does bear some resemblance to Hood ballads. The protagonist solves the issue with a fatal archery competition, which is, you know, familiar. And potentially this Gandolin character might actually be Gamelin from the other ballad as well. Now while I'm not going to touch on how every era has repurposed and portrayed the Robin Hood tales, because that would take me up until very recently, I do want to look at how these stories merged from the Middle Ages into early modern English history. The reign of Henry VIII specifically. The Tudor era is where we see a literary fleshing out of the stories, and many of the tropes and characters that modern viewers will recognise and maybe consider iconic actually came from writers of this time period. Henry was notably enamoured with the outlaw legends. There is a story of him and his companions dressing up as Robin Hood and his merry men in order to play a prank on his first wife, Catherine. The Robin Hood stories flourished throughout the Tudor era, and it's perhaps pretty obvious as to why, when given the context of this era, you also consider that Robin was a character who predominantly fought against a corrupt, bloated, and overly powerful church. It would have been unlikely for Henry to have decreed what authors and playwrights were to write about during his reign, but if you wanted your work to be successful, it was best to write in a manner that would please the king should that work ever reach him. It is during this era that we see the additions of several well-known characters. Now, Maid Marian is a big one. This inclusion is potentially a cultural defence of marrying for love, despite the circumstances. A parallel to the real-life romance between Henry and Anne Boleyn, which ended well, of course. Even more politically intended, potentially, is the character of Friar Tuck, who is a simple holy man in comparison to the rich, corrupt clergyman who made up the original villains in opposition to Robin Hood. If this character mirrors anything, it could be the opinions of those that supported the Reformation and Henry's dissolution of the monasteries. In this era, we also begin to see the placement of Robin Hood within Richard the Lionheart's era, as well as his most famous outlaw activity, robbing the rich to give back to the poor. The peak of the Tudor era Robin Hood stories would however come in the Elizabethan era, with the plays of Anthony Mundy, which thankfully have passed down to us. Mundy was a contemporary of Shakespeare and may have even been an influence on the more famous English bard. So this was me dipping my toe back into the Robin Hood legends and their historical relevance. I hope you've enjoyed it. As usual, I'm going to do a short breakdown on the historiography as a follow-up video looking at how the historians have bickered back and forth about this history. But for now, thank you for listening to me ramble on, and farewell.